all in Sarajevo. <laughs> but you are there. <laughs> you are together. Uh, we, we don't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hello? Yeah, it's hello. Good now. Yeah. And we switch to the question of uh, human rights and urbanism and with you to also all the question of uh, so, so, social ecological question of uh, urban development and uh, urban strategies. So I, I think we, we will polarize a little bit about uh, the, the work you do for the UNO and this uh, dimension you had to uh, uh, to, to think this uh, urban uh, right to the urban uh, city in the future. <laughs> yes, um, first of all, thank you uh, very much, um, Vera and Rudy, for inviting us, uh, for being part of it. And obviously, uh, there is no possibility to show anything of our work without showing at the same time your work, because <laughs> I think the, um, the overlaps are obvious. And uh, you're also very happy. I, I see Miguel. Hello, Miguel. And also... Roger is uh, somewhere, uh, I just saw him a moment ago. And uh, what we would like to do is, uh, what we always do, um, uh, use more our personal experience uh, as a compass to uh, discuss this topic um, than our, let's say, our observations on what's going on in daily business. So uh, um, Michael and I, uh, Michael being in charge of our um, Sarajevo office, and and I will, um, and we will bring in also what we're doing at the moment in in Colombia uh, mostly um, and, and in Sarajevo. So Zurich obviously is our teaching hub. This is where we teach at the ETH, at the ETH, but um, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing is obviously non-solicited, and uh, as you know, and. Uh, we want to ask ourselves a little bit what it actually means when we talk about the SDG. What does it really mean for the people in the rest of the world, in the places where we work? Um, also, two weeks ago, we have been in Kigali. And uh, as you know, um, many of the people on the ground, if we're not talking about this abstract uh, documents of SDGs and all the nice discussions at the uh, COP conference, etc. If you really go out um, in the world, uh, you meet other people. And um, um, I think for me and for the work that we are doing, always these direct encounters were our inspiration and where we are asking also our questions, what are we doing and, and, and how can we, we contribute in a constructive way to what's going on? If um, Because these SDGs uh, and the book you just mentioned, SDG 11, sustainable uh, cities and communities, obviously raises a lot of questions. And I'm, I'm, I just like to start with this one. You know, um, cities and communities are not um, congruent anymore. We cannot discuss communities through cities. Um, 20 years ago, when I studied urban design in Columbia University in New York, cities were not really even on the radar of architecture schools. And I think the the attempt to design cities is something which looks uh, not only impossible, but it also looks like a bad idea because you could also say that uh, it is not about cities. It is actually about this uh, large concept of urbanization. And then also this picture makes suddenly a lot more sense because uh, what is going on in the world is um, um, depending on where you look it has it has much to do with the um, more liquid part of urbanization, which is people and and cities are often discussed only as a physical form or as something which is built and uh, something we can look at. But um, from our point of view, um, the obvious uh, relationship between those pictures, uh, which are about uh, two hundred years apart. Uh, is clear. Uh, this picture has been much like a, uh, it has been uh, looked at uh, in in Paris, in France, in the Salon, um, much like uh, one of the big blockbusters that you would see today in movies. And we also very, as you know, we are very interested in movies and we make these sort of documentaries because we think our work 
um, is probably most interesting, not in what we are building, but also the possibility that we can research, teach and discuss it just like now that the value of the project is maybe less of what we really do and more in how we communicate it. And uh, I think this becomes more and more important also if we're looking at social media and at other uh, questions, because it seems that it has a much bigger influence. However, to stay for a moment with um, Jericho, um, uh, what is interesting here is that um, um, Jericho was researching the raft. The raft of this uh, shipwrecked people of the Medusa, um, uh, which is in a way a project. I think it is very interesting that um, also this, this, this painting of the raft of the Medusa was a non-solicited project. It was a, a, a sort of a project that came out of an understanding that we need to talk about uh, these things that are happening in the world. The events are all over the place. Um, we can discuss now the SDGs and, and other elements, but uh, we think it is about the project and not only about the process. A, a lot of people today, to my mind, are only discussing about processes anymore, which is incredibly important. It's about methods and processes, but I still think we need uh, the project, at least in our understanding how we live, it is a sort of an evidence of um, what we can contribute because everything else is in the danger to um, uh, be in a discourse, but the question is always who do we reach with this discourse? So um, we are thinking here in one example, an example of uh, Colombia. As you know, I grew up professionally in, in Caracas in Venezuela, uh, living through uh, a revolution just following the old line of Corbusier architecture or um, um, revolution. I think there is no or anymore. It, there can only be an end. And uh, in the sense that what I discuss right now, I, I think um, uh, things we are designers and architects, we think that this revolution needs to be uh, taking place, whatever it takes. If you think about um, the, uh, what you hear over the last half years in the news, there's very little about um, what is going on in Latin America. You probably hear about streams of people who move through the Darien Strait uh, in Panama to the border of the United States um, and Mexico. But what is going on in Latin America, there's very little knowledge. Every once in a while, there's something popping up. And I just give you two items. Seven million Venezuelans have left uh, their country, but they're also about the same number of people internally displaced in, in Colombia. And this is a, a huge challenge, uh, exactly talking about what is sustainable about this displacement. And I think this displacement in itself um, might also lead to, uh, to the question if there cannot be more liquid responses from our point of view. There's a housing, um, you know, the right to the city is irrelevant if we, are, if we don't believe anymore that the city is the only destination. The, the people are floating around through uh, the countryside. They're looking in rural areas to resettle and they're completely different uh, models. I just point out, you all know Gabriela's project on Save my identity, seven million of Venezuelans moving around uh, in Latin America and in the world undocumented. And I think this documentation is a sort of a, um, a question of this urbanization process to even to participate, just like what uh, Lars said earlier about life. Okay, you can be alive, but you still might not exist in our system um, that we're discussing. And the, I think it's much about this visibility. Okay, to move um, a, a bit fast forward, um, in Colombia there's a peace process, but the peace process doesn't mean um, that there's not a conflict in that as well. So um, what we have been um, looking at a lot is this topic of inequality, as you know, uh, and going into one city, Cartagena, which is the most unequal city in Colombia, in an already very unequal country, uh, there's this situation of um, large-scale rising sea levels, but in reality, not as an abstract 
discussion that might happen somewhere or it, it could uh, affect us somewhere, but it is a it is a fact. It's happening everywhere, um, and it is a it is about resettling. And this resettling, uh, I think, uh, is less important perhaps in the little project that we are doing, uh, as you know, because you're also involved in it in many um, different ways. Uh, but it is interesting in the numbers what it means in Colombia. Uh, Colombia is short of 50,000 classrooms for kids. So you can also say maybe we don't need classrooms anymore, but you need some places, maybe much more important than a city, is a school almost in nowhere land. And this is exactly what we have been developing, a school in a place where nothing exists, um, where basically informal settlements are sprouting up in and around. And you see here, um, uh, a little bit of it, uh, where we just say, well, let people build their informal settlements. They know how to do that, eight meters above sea level, and let's just build the school. I think in our discussions about what we are able to do and where should we concentrate, it is a, a question about making choices and the question also about um, speed uh, um, of what we can do in relatively little time. Um, and in a similar way in Barranquilla, uh, in Barrio Abajo, um, in this in this environment that we're looking at, where we equally have been uh, touching on this topic uh, with your incredible, powerful uh, support on on making this this building also a statement that is readable and understandable um, to a whole uh, culture um, of the city, the culture of the carnival but also implementing this deindustrialization that the city is uh, going through. And I would say that deindustrialization means also a deurbanization. I think we are, we are much too focused on growing cities. To my mind, cities will uh, 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 come up in other places, but that once again, if the SDG is called cities and communities, I think it should be called communities and urbanization, because uh, many of the cities that we are looking at uh, are de-urbanizing, and the areas which are on the edges of cities, like here in Medellin, that you know very well, and I know there are a couple of other speakers, you could say the, the informal city, which is not part of the services of the city, of the infrastructure of the city, are suddenly reconnected, and this is not a photo montage, but these are the pictures uh, that we share with uh, the now again elected mayor, Fico Gutierrez, who just was re-elected uh, re again. And the project of uh, bringing these climate corridors in the city and what it actually does, I would say, I go back again, you could also read it as a a project of de-urbanization of a city as we knew it, because this is the city that we thought a city looks like. And, and watch any film, Taxi Driver, Manhattan. I know Miguel, you're sitting in Brooklyn probably, or somewhere else in the world, but I know how, how strongly, obviously, these motives of cities have shaped our world. And we think that only in the Western world, suddenly, we're having the luxury uh, through de-industrialization to suddenly uh, create a competition that was basically on the basis of the whole urbanization and industrialization project, either the city or the uh, natural environment, suddenly this seems to be evaporating. And if that is true that it evaporates, I would declare this, that this whole, um, this whole object of city should be seen in the possibility, in the in, in, a, in a very interesting possibility to de-urbanize communities um, and, and in that way also reaching another level of um, communication. And I... I, I Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Hubert. It was uh, like you do it every time. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic topic. Uh, just uh, we have to switch to Sarajevo. We have ten, ten yes. minutes more because we yes. have to be uh, on. Yes, on yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course. We landed in a in a flow, no, from Colombia directly into into Sarajevo, 
because we believe that this fantastic topic, you know, what you're bringing up here about human rights, so important, also interesting to discuss in the context of Sarajevo, because not only there is a global campus for human rights, and you, you met our friends uh, as well in Venice, but also around those topics, also what uh, Lars started to mention about water, I think it's similarly uh, equally uh, valid for a clean air, no access to uh, clean air, but also access to, for example, daylight, no, uh, especially into those circadian rhythms, which are human and also nature and plants. And we talked about green corridors is an integral aspect of um, that uh, element. And if there is such a situation like in Sarajevo and in many other cities in valley situations, we have this inversion weather phenomena where then daylight suddenly cannot penetrate anymore the surface where people uh, live or where plants are, are growing. So suddenly we have too much better also as architects and designers to understand those uh, situations and to collect more information and to collect more data. That's why we are so interested in developing our own tools and methods in order to tackle those questions of uh, human rights and, and, and this climatic behavior. And we, of course, want to shift also our thinking away of traditional reading, which you had it in Sarajevo was a very linear reading, also a growing reading, but to rather include it into a development uh, similar to a burek, uh, which is a traditional food in uh, uh, Sarajevo, and to sort of unwrap and unroll this burek around the existing topography, the Hum and Zhuc mountain. So we call it the burek plan, the burek urban plan, because we believe that also we have to bring those topics into policy making. So we have to not only work uh, bottom up, which we love to do, but also we have to come in uh, from the top to, uh, from the top to influence those people. And we can do that exactly with those tools uh, which we developed uh, the Studio Mobile, also together with uh, Rudy, you know it, and Vera, you know it very well. Now we, we had many interesting discussions also outdoors, you know, that, that is in, important for us to bring those top-down institutions outside into the city to where people live in the hillside settlements where there are maybe challenges to uh, be discussed but there's also a lot of ideas and people to be included in those processes and with this studio mobile we can then collect also our own data and i always like to bring that into the discussion and now the eu also made the first regulation on ai uh, globally you know so i think this aspect of digitalization in the context of urbanization and ecologization is very relevant in the discussion around human, human rights, who can participate in these digital discussions, who knows uh, the language to participate. No, we know English, not everybody knows English, but who knows coding, Python, C++. It excludes many people in that discussion. So I think collecting own data, collecting own information discussing it on the ground, in the field, making it accessible, open source, creative commons, no, for who, for who is it, and also to collaborate with um, established institutions like the Global Campus uh, for uh, Human Rights is very important. Also, especially bringing those topics here, you can see, into different places uh, around the world, and particularly coming back uh, into Sarajevo, we always like to bring those maybe abstract concepts. Also, the human rights no, is a very abstract um, idea. And th those were the sustainable development goals. The SDGs tried to somehow more concretely translate the human rights into clear um, actions. But we as architects and designers tried to propose uh, concrete ideas which um, uh, serve as a platform for people to join and to participate no, on the ground, but also solve uh, in the same time issues 
like we have in Sarajevo about uh, public transport or uh, private, uh, especially private vehicles, because of, for example, ownership, land ownership. No, that's also an important um, aspect. Who owns the land? For who is it good for? And for what it is used? And trying also on a legal framework suddenly to change those uh, 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 formats from ownership into maybe public ownership. And I think also in this discussion around um, blockchain as a technology, but also the uh, co-ownership and, and sharing ownership and uh, fantastic also initiatives in Sarajevo exist around uh, uh, museums and art that the citizens are owning the uh, art pieces and the citizens owning, for example, buildings. I think this sort of ownership in this discussion is also very um, um, uh, important, not only on the data ownership side, but also on a on a land ownership and concrete uh, 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 side. So translating those ideas into public spaces, covered public spaces, spaces where people can engage, where different uh, people uh, can meet, where different institutions uh, can gather, is for us a sort of translation of uh, those human right idea into concrete uh, proposals for, um, for the cities. Because urbanization is, of course, much faster than whatever we can predict or plan. So I think buildings have to sort of uh, uh, accompany these processes how we can actually live and co-design uh, in a city to include as many uh, uh, people as possible. And that's why we founded also this initiative of the Architecture Olympics uh, in Sarajevo. That was the first time because Sarajevo, you remember 1984 had the uh, Olympic games. Next year is the 40 years of uh, celebration of those games. So I think also sports as a human right, no be, uh, movement and sort of uh, uh, outdoor training uh, was for us an inspiration, particularly because uh, until the 30s, uh, the also architecture and dance performances and art was giving uh, medals. And we thought we have to sort of invite also countries from uh, all over the world to join that architecture Olympic, not with uh, sort of athletes, but with architecture and design ideas and proposals. And we are bringing now this architecture Olympics uh, next year to um, Tirana. And uh, we call this theme in Tirana, the Meditirana, like the Mediterraneanization of Tirana, Meditirana. And that was from news from Sarajevo to Tirana wow. from Thanks a lot, uh, Michael. Uh, like Robert, uh, like every time was very professional. We we switch uh, from disurbanization to uh, uh, use Olympic game as energy to uh, make new conception of cities. I like this. Uh, uh, work of uh, of the construction, and I hope really uh, we have this energy in Paris next year to uh, deconstruct the Olympic game and to uh, bring it in another way as only a bullshit sport uh, manifestation. Thanks, yeah. uh, there, uh, Miguel, my friend Miguel. Uh, you are urbanist, uh, professor at the uh, University New School in New York. You was co-founder of the non-profit cohabitation strategy in uh, Rotterdam uh, uh, and uh, New York. Uh, and uh, you work on a very interesting uh, project who uh, try to say how can we uh, bring the cities and the politician to have another uh, knowledge as the yet knowledge. The, I, I think a part of your uh, work is really uh, based on the right of the city of uh, Henri Lefebvre, uh, who can uh, directly be connected about the human declarations 
uh, is a, a kind of complementary of this element to say also the the right of the city has has a, a, a important dimension. Can you react there, Miguel, on uh, this yet situation about city, what, ecology? <laughs> And, and your fight uh, uh, with, your, with your organization, Urban Front. And, and, <laughs> and this in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Okay. It's it's super nice to see you, uh, Vera, Rudy, um, and also okay. Hubert. Uh, uh, hello over there. Um, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, crazy uh, third night of uh, global social rights. Um, I really don't know how do you stay awake, but it's great. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I, I think um, my first intervention would be to react a bit on what Hubert uh, just mentioned. Hopefully this could be the beginning of a longer sort of conversation in the, in the coming future between us. Um, but um, there was a, a bit of, a, I think, of a, uh, of a very different conception of what urbanization is and what city is, right? Um, if you come from the architecture and the urban design perspective, uh, we tend to think, or those tend to think, those people that are working in that space uh, tend to think about cities as, as physical agglomerations, right? Um, and this is precisely one of the big differences that, uh, that uh, Henri Lefebvre started to talk about when he was writing on when he first coined the term, uh, the right to the city or la droit la ville. Um, and uh, which, you know, first of course appeared as a, as a, as a text in, in French. Um, and that was, if I am not mistaken, in 1969, uh, uh, but I might be wrong. So um, the, the main difference from this is that um, if you take the teachings of Henri Lefebvre, which was obviously based a lot on Karl Marx's sort of critique of capital, and you will begin to understand that urbanization has nothing to do with cities. And, and that I think is the first misconception. And uh, one that I have been working uh, a lot uh, for almost 20 years, uh, you know, when, when I met you, uh, you know, a long time ago um, and has been evolving, right? So what is this idea that urbanization has not precisely anything to do with cities? I mean, of course it is cities, but um, if you look at urbanization as, uh, or the way I look at it as the process in which capitalism materializes in space. Um, and that is something I, I always tend to say uh, when I speak publicly. So we're not talking about just the making of specific urban agglomerations. Uh, we're talking about the way in which capitalism is reconstructing the whole planetary ter territory, the whole, every space. So from, from that distinction, for many of us that, that look at, at urbanization from this perspective or from the Lefebvrean and later, of course, David Harvey developed this a bit more uh, perspective. We see um, that uh, that there's no distinction between uh, rural and urban and suburban and uh, and you know whatever kinds of names and territories would we that come from sort of a very very positivist sort of conception of the territory or or dual you know conception like you know the, the typical sort of fight between rural and urban. Um, and for us, that distinction does not exist because it's part of the same process in which, you know, capitalism requires to materialize um, its, uh, its dominance in space, right? And so uh, if we look at it from this, uh, my interest in urbanization is precisely that. It's how does it become concrete? So whereas, um, uh, as you know, I work very closely with uh, one of the main theorists of the right to the city, which is uh, David Harvey. Um, David Harvey enters a space from a, a very uh, uh, abstract conception um, and very, very well so because he always argues that we live in a world of abstractions and therefore we must understand and abstractions, what I bring into the into our, I guess, partnership or, or uh, to, you know, work together is my interest in the materialization of those abstractions in the concrete. And that, I guess, falls into what we um, tend to refer, especially in this panel, as what design is, right, and so forth. And so I just wanted to first stress this. Um, now, uh, to touch a bit more on the terms of uh, human rights in relationship to all of this, I also thought that it was very important to mention that human rights, the way they are inscribed in the United Nations, um, uh, are by no, no doubts, I mean, uh, by all means, they're part of the, 
same socioeconomic structure uh, of society of capitalism, right? Um, they are uh, forms of, of looking at capitalism as a way of, uh, that it's possible to have a, a good form of capitalism, right? That if, if within this capitalist structure, we have human rights, then everything's going to be fine. Well, well, I'll, I'm here, of course, to, to denounce that. Uh, there's no form of acquiring human rights that we desire and that you have been speaking here if uh, capitalism does not uh, sort of perish, collapse. And therefore, our fight uh, has always been uh, an anti-capitalist fight. Um, and by this, we mean that, um, that, that human rights source have this tendency of hiding or distracting from us discussing about capitalism as such. I'm not arguing that it's wrong to discuss human rights. I think it's, it's super important to discuss them under the context of class struggle, environmental destruction, and the constant economic exploitation that we are uh, looking for. And of course, you know, which are the many roots of the violence that we are, uh, you know, fighting for, right? Of this violence against every single form of living uh, uh, that exist and non-living things that exist in our planet. And so in, in this sense, um, somehow I always internalize the idea of a human rights declaration, specifically the United Nations one, as uh, something that is there to protect and to somehow reproduce the values of the capitalist class and the political powers that support it, right? And so uh, there are specifically two articles that I find incredibly problematic in the Declaration of Human Rights. The first one is the family, this is the one 16.3, so it's, a, it's the 16th article point three, where it declares that the family is the natural and fundamental group of a society and is entitled to protection of society by the state. Uh, honestly, I mean, like, what the hell is this? I mean, like, the family is the natural, you know, fundamental group. What, what are we talking about here? And this refers a lot to urbanization, because urbanization from the perspective of the capitalist class is precisely part of it, the definition of spaces for this kind of idea of a family. When you work with indigenous groups, with other kinds of social formations, with, with queer, uh, you know, people uh, that are creating other forms of living that don't tend to apply to that conception of the, you know, papa, mama, two dogs and, you know, two kids and so on and so forth, right? And a suburban home, which is kind of like the idea that gets reproduced in this. We can start to think of, of course, of another dimension that urbanization could bring if we didn't have that some kind of like oppressive apparatus that, that the, one of the purposes of cities is to create space for the family. And then the one that I, it's even more problematic for me is Article 17.1, which is um, the following. It says, everyone has the right, right to own property. Um, and it's just like alone or in association with others. I mean, this is, I guess, the heart, I mean, for all of us working in questions of urbanization, is the emphasis of the continuation of private property as a part of a human right is ridiculous. Right. If anything, you know, we have to question um, in a very radical forms all things that come from private property. Um, an idea of private, private property is not something that we should take lightly. Right. But it's at the heart of a lot of the, again, questions of violence, displacements, among many of the things that Hubert um, was discussing right now that that happened. Right. The, the, the mass migrations and all of that. Um, well, they're pinpoint, you know, from their access to some kind of property. And in that point, that access to that property becomes incredibly problematic, right? Um, and I know that I have very little time right now to process on, uh, on whatever it is, but I wanted to continue on these questions of uh, urbanization as, yes, one very important thing is the destruction or the sort of reimagining of other forms of property systems, which is something that I have been working all my life and the partners, you know, within Urban Front and all of these other organizations we've been trying to push and develop, you know, what would it mean to create uh, an anti-capitalist or let's say a non-speculative property system that works in tandem with uh, with right now, with, of course, we cannot destroy the private property because that would create more, more wars than we have now. As a matter of fact, a lot of the wars are fought be be because of this, right? But is it possible um, to think about the production of um, property systems that, uh, that erode the idea that property is a commodity, that a home is a commodity, right? And the question for, for, for me and for many designers, I guess, should be, 
how can we help cities take or the process of urbanization, take the production of housing, first of all, out of the control of the predatory financiers and speculators. Um, and this is like, like I think super important, right? In Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, and wherever it is, speculate property speculation controls the access that we have to the city. So that that questions of the right to the city are being pointed by precisely, well, there's no access to it, you know, who owns these things. So therefore, if we want to take more seriously the current housing crisis, and we know that it's planetary, it's not only that, that here in Brooklyn, you were very right, Hubert, um, uh, that, that here in Brooklyn, we uh, we basically cannot afford homes. I mean, like it's impossible. Um, the average uh, rental for a one bedroom is $4,000 a month. Um, it's not even close to what the majority of people make uh, a month, right? So how is it possible that we can afford a city? But this is planetary. You know, right now we are working very closely with Mexico City in developing um, uh, rent, rent stabilization policies uh, with the city. Um, and we see Mexico City is, is as hard as of a crisis as it is now. It, the same is in Paris, the same could be anywhere. I mean, I could, you know, Johannesburg uh, in, in Sao Paulo, whatever. It, we have a, a planetary crisis, you know, of housing. And therefore um, we must approach this by innovating in non-speculative and limited housing, limited equity housing models. And of course, reimagine, and I take back to that second part, the, the, the first article that I mentioned that I was I found very problematic, reimagine forms of living that don't take as a basis the unitary structure of, uh, of a family, right? Mm -hmm. Mama, Papa, et cetera, in order to look into the creation of commons of collective production, of cooperative ownerships, of economic emancipation, of uh, democra other forms of democratic organization. No? And so this, uh, in our uh, point of view, has been, or my point of view, has been an, an essential part of thinking about the right to the city. If we look at the right to the city, as David Harvey uh, actually wrote about it, which is the most common form of understanding the right to the city by now, which is the right that all of us should have to determine our own environment, well, then questioning private property, you know, as part of the principles should be essential, right? And of course, moving it out, or develop, sort of sending it out of the control of predatory and speculative finance industries um, and, uh, and develop the alternative economic financial models that could prioritize solidarity, collectivity, equality, community control, transparency, and of course, environmental responsibility. So I could continue going more and more, but I wanted to bring this at the at the at, at this discussion to so perhaps you know we can yeah uh, uh, you know have a, a nice uh, debate. So thank wow. you very much, both of you. Thank you so much, Miguel. And um, this it's so important because when we uh, were together <clears throat> in Venice, we. We heard that now uh, the, the the question um, of human rights and and uh, housing and architecture, housing maybe, but architecture is not always connected and seen as connected. And what you have shown is uh, how much um, uh, the the shaping of our living together is a political question, and uh, it's not just about building volumes, but it's been building uh, social interrelations and. Um, and I think that it's very important to bring more agency uh, to this. Um, and and um, I think this brings us maybe to the next uh, uh, partner uh, in our discussion, even if I would love to discuss more with you. But we, we, will, we will try to have five minutes uh, to, to make a new round because I see, but I think it's interesting to introduce Roger uh, Yes, who, who will more uh, speak about public space. So it's also a kind of uh, negative of uh, this property to say, what is this uh, dimension who uh, today uh, is the only pro a part who is not private, but how can we extend this and say in the future, perhaps the public space can be very larger as what we think it today when we think uh, we take away this idea of uh, Article 16, or I don't <laughs> remember what was your article, uh, Miguel. 17.1. 17. 17. Uh, so, uh, Roger, you are with us, and we are curious how uh, you find uh, 
your way now after this just, two just a little presentation roger for the people who, who don't know you you come from uh, as, um, no catalonia uh, who is a part of, uh, in the moment, a part of Spain, and uh, you teach and research, uh, mostly research, in the design school of uh, Elisava in uh, Barcelona. Uh, you are architects and you make many things also with Civic City. Well, thank, thank, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me, uh, Vera and Rudy, and thanks a lot uh, to um, Hubert and Michael and Miguel and everybody else. Um, um, I have not prepared uh, a proper presentation as Hubert and Michael have, um, but um, hopefully I will be able to contribute slightly to the conversation. Um, I also think I would like to to have a little time to discuss because it's uh, I think it's very interesting to be able to to discuss amongst us, um, but just to kind of take your question about public space and relate it um, a little bit to the previous um, speakers without trying to go too much deeply into, let's say, um, excessively Byzantine nomenclature sort of uh, discussions, because otherwise we may fall into a trap here. Um, I think that, uh, uh, again, public space itself, on the one hand, it's a very, very important dimension, I would say, of the urban. I will use the city here broadly, you know, change for urbanization or whatever you want. I, I'm not right interested in, 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 in picking straws here. But I think it's a very, very fundamental dimension, but also it's a problematic one uh, in many senses. Uh, and, uh, and I think it touches on some of the things that, uh, that, uh, that my uh, peers have been discussing here. Um, the first thing that I would like to say about uh, this understanding of public space is that public space is, is really, uh, again, it's an abstraction, but it's something that has been uh, won um over many many years and, and through very specific and concrete fights too so that's something that i mean when we start criticizing public space um um in you know in kind of a generic uh, uh in a generic sense if you will i think that sometimes we forget about the fact that public space is not something that comes in naturally if you will and that as most um, aspects of the city um is the product of very specific struggles um Actually, uh, an example of that, and going back to some of the things that uh, Hubert was talking about, is that one of the main problems uh, of uh, current systems of uh, or current modes of urbanization uh, worldwide um, is precisely that they lack a public space or something that we can e equate to a certain kind of public space. And by public space, I mean, in a very, very basic sense, that space of the potential encounter with difference or with the other. Um, and I think that this is a very important uh, question, um, and uh, it touches on a, a few things uh, that I would like to address. I think that the first is a question of time or temporality. The second is the question of the 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 realm, if you will, uh, of uh, public space between public and private space. You know, these uh, rather extensive, um, let's say, dimensions um, that uh, that that we have there. And then there's the question also of understanding conflict. Uh, in public space as, as a potentially generative aspect, um, which I think it's also very important to avoid simplistic and usually, and again, very uh, um, basic understanding of public space, which only cater to uh, the mama and papa, as Miguel was uh, discussing before. So um, let me start with the second one. I think that uh, one of the main problems that we encounter now when we think about public space and when we work in public space, whatever public space may mean, let's not delve too deeply into the uh, definition of that, um, is the fact that uh, in uh, it means very different things in different parts of the world, of course. Uh, uh, but in the West, for instance, uh, what tends to happen now is that there's a massive polarization between uh, the public realm and the private realm. And that's very much related to the question of private property, of course, as, um, as uh, Miguel um, pointed out, rightly so. Uh, and uh, essentially, private, you know, the private domain is where we 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 think or it it is it is assumed that everybody has um uh, let's say um lordship over which is a very problematic concept i think and comes from a certain idea of property which is possibly a roman idea of property where property means the the possibility of destroying which is not all you know not all cultures have this um understanding of property 
Um, and then public is understood, and let me simplify very quickly, as, as the space of the municipality or the space of the institution, if you will. So the space that is formally, it's everybody's, but we don't feel it, or, or in general, communities do not feel it as their own. So here, I think that there is a, a, a very important concept, which is also a Lefebvrean concept, which is that of appropriation. Uh, that to me is fundamental. Um, how can we, through design practices, I, I totally agree with my peers here in the need to be situated and be very concrete uh, from the point of view of design. So how through uh, specific design practices can we prompt uh, appropriation of public spaces? And, um, and the appropriation is again, a problematic concept, a very important but problematic concept uh, in the sense that uh, who is appropriating uh, public space and for what and for how long? And we'll go back to the question of time. So to be very simple or simplistic here, uh, we could understand that a desirable understanding of appropriation would be uh, the capacity of public space or to be, um, um, uh, again, appropriated by all, but not co-opted by anyone uh, uh, throughout, throughout the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the whole uh, expanse of time. So this to me is a very important um, question. How can we um, think about design, produce design uh, practices and concepts and specific uh, spaces that prompt this uh, appropriation? Can we, way, uh, this, uh, try, sorry. Can we try to, to connect now this idea of uh, uh, green uh, uh, corridors uh, hmm. and this appropriation and perhaps this uh, not only disurbanization, but also deprivatization uh, of a part of the public space, uh, of a part of the city, sorry. How yeah, I think can we totally work on this deprivatization for to say uh, uh, it's necessary for the common. Uh, yes, I think that, I think the very idea, Rudy, the very idea of the commons, um, as a, as is understood in, in 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 certain societies, for instance, in I don't know in in mountain societies in in Europe, it it, it is it was still until a few you know a hundred years ago a very common uh, idea, the idea of the commons, right, um, is very much related to what you're saying. Um, the idea of this uh, dimension of the city or, or or urbanized or or habitat, let's put it this way, of the human habitat. Um, that is uh, usable by all, appropriable by all in the sense, it's not only usable, I think it's important the idea of appropriable in the sense of I, I can uh, feel that it belongs to me and my specific interests. So it's a very important question in terms of uh, politics also. It's not a question of use, the right of use only, but the right of, uh, of, of actually uh, being able to make in my own space. I think that this is a very crucial question. Uh, but also related to the the fundamental right of everybody else to do so, you know, and uh, in a way, uh, properties that are you know the very old idea of commons is related to that. So certain um, trends of uh, I think badly called renaturalization of the city. I think perhaps the idea of deurbanization or a more complex kind of urbanization is more is more interesting. Could uh, or are I think very much linked uh, with that. Again, um, sometimes it happens and. Barcelona is a very good example of what's happening, you know, a very dense um, uh, city right now. And there's been a lot of debate uh, uh, of the last um, um, attempt of, uh, let's say, opening um, certain streets fundamentally for like more common use. So removing cars from the streets and renaturalizing some of the streets. That has also become somewhat problematic because it has also fostered um, um, a lot of privatization uh, of these uh, spaces. And uh, and uh, and uh, they they have ended up uh, being used, or they tend to be used for uh, commercial purposes, and not necessarily for for more uh, open social purposes. So, I would say that yes, the idea of uh, of um, uh, um, understanding how we can use these empty spaces, if you were empty from building, you no, know, these um, un unspecified spaces, which I think is a, a good concept too. You know, these spaces that are. Um, that that are um, that, that allow for different kinds of uses in a very structural way, and that again uh, they are able to um, be used in different ways in different times, in time, which is a very very important question I think to me um, is a is a, is really a way forward, and it's something that I think it's uh, being addressed uh, somehow. Um, yeah. I I also think that uh, just to insist a little bit more on this on this concept 
of uh, of time that one of the I mean to to answer answering a little bit um, or, or or taking the the, the concept of uh, Miguel I agree with you Miguel um, that the question of property and private property is uh, very problematic but I also think that uh, it's not a fight that can be fought in the abstract or in the general only and it's very important how do we uh, in a very concrete ways in very situated manners we're able to let's say uh, we're able to 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 hack, if you will, this uh, very very um, strong um, idea of uh, private property as something that's exclusive, right? And in this sense, the idea of of time or temporary uses of space is is something that I'm very interested in. It's something that happens naturally in cities, right? That certain spaces um, are used in different ways in different times, times of the year, times of the day, times of the, you know seasons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that we, if we are able to incorporate this temporality in 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 design strategies and in specific design solutions, that is a very interesting way—not the only way, but a very interesting way of opening up this uh, monolithic understanding of uh, of property, if you will. Thanks a lot, Roger. We have two minutes for Hubert and two minutes for Miguel. Uh, yes, maybe a. Uh, uh, and a half minute for <laughs> yes, maybe a minute. No, uh, thanks. I, 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 I think we could fill a lot more of your 24 hours in continuing this um, conversation, but I just want to um, uh, bring a response uh, to uh, Roger's um, and maybe also to Miguel's uh, intervention. Uh, I think there are examples of non aligned urbanization. Um, um, Michael was talking earlier about Sarajevo, uh, which went to a very interesting process of socially owned uh, property. Everything was socially owned during the um, time of the Yugoslav uh, special non-aligned um, way. Then it became government owned. Interesting, because in most Eastern Bloc countries, it was anyways owned by the government, not in ex-Yugoslavia. And now it is privatized, which comes a bit as a shock to everybody there, because it's a concept that I think people have still not understood. And I make the link to something else very concrete. If you look at the list of the most expensive cities just came out, and we're all sitting around in some of them, it's uh, Singapore, Zurich, New York, Hong Kong, Los Angeles, Paris, Copenhagen, Barcelona, San Francisco. So unfortunately, we're all sitting somewhere in those cities. Strange enough, Vienna is not on the list. And Vienna, since years, the, the city with the highest life quality. So it is interesting and a, 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 a good hope for us that the city with the best life quality is not the most expensive city and vice versa. It means we can decouple those two realities. One thing has nothing to do with the other. You could say... Um, uh, you you will find eventually some of those cities also in the city with life qualities. Funny enough, inversively, Vienna is not on the list. And I do know uh, a little bit about Vienna. And one of the things is uh, that the housing is owned 50% by the city. It's very small, very modest. Uh, in Zurich, they would break some of these houses down, including the Karl Marxhof, because it's not um, uh, up. Uh, there's a word in German which is called Zeitgemäß. It's not up to our times, you know, the size of the bedroom, the kitchen relation to a very small balcony. People would say this is not Zeitgemäß, we need to break the house down. But I do think there's many different ways how we could survive, which is not this, um, uh, uh, Miguel, you mentioned it a couple of times, your atomic family description. I think there are many different places and we could just the other way around also look at these informal uh, practices as an in-between phase to something which would actually provide the right to the housing. Because we, the right to that housing that uh, these sort of um, commercial um, formats, uh, that certainly will not work. That's clear. Yeah, just to add maybe one. One thought, and then we go. No, 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 no. Uh, we have to to stop. What also, also, Miguel cannot speak. I ah. think uh, this was <laughs> was a good expression of no, 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 no. <laughs> to find a solution. Oh, okay. Sorry, justice, <laughs> was a, was justice, and justice, and time, time switch. I'm gonna take Hooper's Hooper's time next the next time. <laughs> uh, you know. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, dear friends. And uh, I think it was a very important topic about this uh, city future and the way to look at the city and the way to look at the, a kind of deprivatization and decapitalization of the city. But bye bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will continue with the topic, which is. Uh, 